I chose Thomas Paine, the American revolutionary writer, to be the person who I want to meet for my What is America project because I think that many aspects of his life truly define what is America. Throughout American history, people have looked up to the idea of self-made man, right? The idea of a person who's able to achieve success not through the help from others, but through his own grit and hard work. And Thomas Paine is a man who embodies these ideals of the self-made man. He was raised by a poor corset maker father who could only afford him a free education in the local free grammar school for up to age 13. And his lack of formal education resulted in a very not prosperous career in Britain. He tried careers at uh, shopkeeping, corset trade, and sailing, but failed in everything that he had tried. And by 1774, he has divorced two times and was bankrupt, which is prominent, prominently the reason why he had to immigrate from Britain to America. But despite these humble beginnings and his origin as a man of the working class, Thomas Paine was able to overcome these setbacks and eventually sit shoulder to shoulder with the founding fathers of America through the opportunities he created for himself. Reform has also been a constant theme throughout American history, from progressive America to the Great Society. Thomas Paine is a man of reform by heart. 18th century Britain, in which Thomas Paine grew up in, actually really resembled Gilded Age America in many um, sense. First of all, they had farmer oppression. They had the enclosure system pushing farmers off their lands and turning them into landless serfs and factory workers, which was similar to what the populace was tackling in Gilded Age America. They also had a extended period of economic disparity, right? On the outside, we have these joint stock companies earning profits and making certain individuals very rich. But on the work in the working class, commodity prices were rising and wage was stagnating, which made many basic commodities unaffordable to working class people. Uh, they also had this rotten borough system, which was a system of political corruption that allowed certain people to buy votes. Um, and this kind of political corruption and patronage was also what the civil service reformers was tackling in Gilded Age of America. Thomas Paine was raised by a Quaker father, and key tenets of Quakerism, such as anti-establishmentarianism and humanitarian reform, played an important role in shaping how Paine viewed the world. These Quaker worldviews collided with the illusions and disparities of the 18th century British society and resulted in Paine's first political work, which was a muckraking work. It was a work of labor activism known as Case of the Officers of Excise, published in 1772. Payne wrote this when he was serving as a tax collector for the government, and um, he was arguing for increasing wages for him and his fellow excise officers. In the work, he also bitterly pointed out that the wealthy and the humane's affluence has become the misfortune of laboring class people due to the economic disparities. However, the work was unsuccessful in persuading the parliament and eventually had Payne fired. And now a penniless debtor, Payne made a decision very, very similar to many other immigrants that had a situation similar to his in American history, which was to immigrate to the new world and seek opportunities and a new life. Thomas Payne arrived in America in 1774. Not long after his arrival, he was hired to be the editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine, a magazine of little success at the time. Uh, as Payne was adopting a full career in writing, he was also developing his own distinct political language that was populist in nature. As other politicians are using long and traditional essays to engage with politics, Thomas Paine was using unconventional literary, literary forms such as dialogues and poems, as you can see in Liberty Tree, to engage with revolutionary ideologies and politics. And uh, that using these everyday literature really helped him introduce revolutionary ideologies to the common people through the media of Pennsylvania Magazine. Over time, his political language also gained the magazine more revenue, prosperity, subscribers, and success in the contemporary market. Thomas Paine also liked to engage with politics through allegories, and one certain um, analogy he would like to use was the British-American relationship and marriages. Specifically, he liked to argue that in the formation of a marriage, um, true affection should take precedence over consideration of economics and uh, commerce. In, in other words, you should marry the people who you really love, not the people who you want to marry because he or she is rich. So that's some relationship advice from Payne. But he will later connect this argument to independence by arguing that the relationship between Britain and America has been dominated by commerce and mercantilist um, ideologies instead of the true affection between the people on the two continents. 
of Payne's rhetorics and ideas in the Pennsylvania Magazine eventually culminated in his seminal work, Common Sense. How popular was this pamphlet? At a time when most colonial publications had circulation in the 2000s, this work had a circulation of 100,000 in its first year after publication. It was absolutely instrumental in turning the tides of public opinion during the American Revolution. But in this work, we also see how Thomas Paine's political language was radicalizing over time. In this work, he intentionally forgo the use of learned references to history, philosophies, and politics in order to appeal to the knowledge of the general public. So we can see this clear distinction starting to develop between the writing style of educated politicians, educated elites such as John Adams and Thomas Jefferson who wrote with great and delicate argumentation and understanding of philosophical justifications for the American Revolution. But we also see demagogues and, and propagandists like Thomas Paine who wrote with the audience of uneducated general public in mind. And this distinction will soon create controversies over Paine's political language. To illustrate, the most dedicated critic of common sense was a fellow revolutionary, John Adams. Uh, there are several aspects in which John Adams uh, critiqued common sense. First of all, John Adams didn't like the use of the Bible as evidence in common sense. So Thomas Paine used the Bible because you know everybody knows the Bible, but not everyone knows about John Locke and these stuffs. So, but John Adams hated how Thomas Paine used the Bible in argumentation, and he said the use of these evidence was, quote, ridiculous. So that's one. And also John Adams claimed to think that Thomas Paine's arguments were so trivial and unoriginal. For example, he claimed that uh, Thomas Paine arrived in America in 1774, 1775, and found the great question was concerning independence that he just gleaned from those he saw commonplace argument concerning independence. And as a result, quote, not a fact nor a reason stated in common sense had not been frequently urged in Congress. So he's digging the originality of common sense arguments. And in fact, not only John Adams will argue in this way. Many historians such as Sophia Rosenfield, um, Robert Ferguson, also pointed out that Thomas Paine's ideas lacked a coherent ideology, probably due to the reason of Thomas Paine's own lack of deep learning. So this shows how despite common sense, rhetoric and populist approach was extremely popular among the people, it creates a backslash among educated Americans who valued uh, political works for their intellectual profundity rather than their inflammatory rhetoric. So now let's take a pause and take a look at the question, what is America? America is revolutions after revolutions. Throughout the history of this nation, there has been so many conflicts in which this nation is reborn again and again, but America is not afraid of conflicts. Instead, America embraced these conflicts in which people have the same common goal but can't agree on the exact methodology to achieve that goal. And throughout these conflicts, it learns. There has been other nations in the world in which conflicts are not dealt so properly and tolerantly, and in these countries, massacres and purges has taken place between political regimes. America is also about beliefs. We have individuals like Thomas Paine who believed in the common people and in their values, and they are not afraid of the setbacks in mind. For example, Thomas Paine grew up in a destitute setting, but that did not stop him from trying to use his power to improve the living condition and voice of the normal people. And America is not lack of such people with beliefs and the courage to pursue after them. America is also a nation shared by the elites and the people. Who are the true leaders of this nation? Throughout history, different political figures have given different answers. For example, John Adams decided to stand with the elites, but Thomas Paine decided to stand with the people. But debates about what exact role should these two different factions in the population play in political processes also shaped America's political landscape and continue to define this nation today.